We are delighted to welcome you to our first JASA webinar of the new year. As many of our attendees already know, the Japanese Art Society of America promotes the study and appreciation of Japanese arts and culture. We hope you are aware of our website, JapaneseArtSoc.org, our monthly programming, and our peer-reviewed annual journal impressions. This year, JASA will continue its series of Zoom webinars. As a member of the program committee, I am delighted to introduce our special guest speaker, Dr. Yukio Lippet, the Jeffrey T. Chambers and Andrea Okamura, Professor of the History of Art and Architecture at Harvard University. This evening, Professor Lippet will present his new research on the mid to late 16th century monk painter, Sesson, focusing on a singular work by the artist, a pair of screens in the Cleveland Museum of Art. As always, we should expect Professor Lippet to bring to his presentation a deep understanding of Japanese art and history to make his subject come alive to our audience. It is no wonder that scholars, curators, and Japanese art lovers always flock to his lectures and webinars. Hio. I'd like to convey heartfelt thanks to the members of the JASA Program Committee and everyone who helped uh, to bring about this occasion. It's a privilege to have an opportunity to share my research with all of you. Today's lecture on the medieval, medieval Japanese monk painter, Sesson Shuke, stems in part from an exhibition on Sesson that I'd been involved in organizing at the National Museum of Asian Art or the Freer Sackler Galleries in Washington, DC. The exhibition, which would have been the first of its kind in the United States, had been scheduled for the spring of this year, 2021, but was eventually canceled. I was the co-curator along with Dr. Frank Feltons, and I'm deeply indebted to Frank for my understanding of Sesson, as well as to Dr. Aaron Rio of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, who was also involved in preparations. Now, although the exhibition was canceled, it is important to mention here because it was intended among other things, to mark the 10th anniversary of the Tohoku earthquake and nuclear disaster that occurred on March 11th, 2011 in Japan, and to play a small role in commemorating the victims of the disaster by showcasing the artistry of Sesson, who hailed from the region and is one of its most famous cultural figures. Despite the cancellation of the show, fortunately, we did manage to produce a catalog that is slated to appear sometime later this year. I sincerely hope you'll have a chance to refer to the catalog for some of our new findings. This lecture re uh, represents a remaining vector of inquiry that has lingered after three years of sustained study of the artist. More specifically, it examines a well-known work by Sesson, the dragon and tiger screens at the Cleveland Museum of Art, which you see here. In 2016, I had the opportunity to study the work extensively, thanks to Sinead Vilbar, curator of Japanese and Korean art at Cleveland. And I'd like to express my gratitude to her for providing an occasion that proved to be the genesis of many of the ideas presented here. Dragon and Tiger is an especially significant work for the study of Sesson and medieval Japanese ink painting more generally. Although I'll discuss briefly Sesson's life and career, frankly, we know very little about the monk painter or for that matter about Zen monk painters in medieval Japan in general. Nevertheless, the study of individual works can provide innumerable insights about the roles that Zen monk painters played in medieval culture and the myriad meanings that were associated with their works. In particular, Dragon and Tiger, I would propose, illuminates a great deal about the cultural significance of ink painting and the rich imaginary world of medieval Japan onto which it opens up. Let me first say a few words about Sesson. Today, he's counted among the most accomplished ink painters of medieval Japan, second perhaps only to Seshu in terms of name recognition. Many dynamic works of his survive, first and foremost in the genre of figure painting. The Taoist immortal Lu Dengbin in the Yamato Bunkaka Museum in Nara, which you see here, is a work that encapsulates all of the drama and uniqueness of his approach to ink figure painting. 
The subject of the scroll, Lu Dungbin, stands with its back to us, and we are apparently witnessing the moment when the immortal has emerged from the sea, standing on the head of a large dragon. Having just uncorked a vial, Lu looks upwards as more dragons are released into the sky. The drama of the composition is enhanced by the protagonist's pose, with arms spread out as if to bear his chest to the heavens, and his head looking directly upward at an extreme angle. The noodle-like waves from a roiling sea, a characteristic Cesson motif, flail around him, and strong air currents blow his robe, sash, headgear, even his facial hair, in all different directions. He stands at the center of a violent vortex, screaming to the skies. Now, along with his figure paintings, Cesson's landscapes are equally singular. They're characterized by an idiosyncratic approach to landscape forms in which mountains and hillocks tend to lean and sway from one side to the other, emphasizing their plasticity as if they're being stretched and pulled laterally. Also notable is a highly rhythmic approach to the distribution of light and dark applications of ink in a manner that underscores how the prerogatives of ink gradation have superseded those of representation itself. Cesson is also represented by numerous significant works in American collections, of which, of course, Dragon and Tiger is one. There are many other examples. I'll simply mention here uh, White Herons in Plum and uh, Willows, a pair of screens in the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and the remarkable Landscape of the Four Seasons screens in Chicago, both among the most noteworthy examples of their subjects from the Muromachi period. Indeed, Cesson's extant corpus is considerable. A catalog resume published uh, around 40 years ago include, included over 140 works, with many more coming to light since then. Now, Sesson was already famous in the early per uh, Edo period. He's prominently mentioned in the Honcho Gashi, uh, the earliest published compendium of biographies of Japanese painters dated to 1693, as well as in many other painting treatises. During this era, we know that uh, numerous works. He was so famous that forgeries of his were circulating, thanks to the authentication diaries of painters such as Kano Tanyu and Kano Tsunenobu, of, of which you see examples here on the right. One of the truly fascinating aspects of Sesson's reception history is that the Kyoto painter Ogata Koring was clearly an admirer and appears to have carefully studied Sesson. One wouldn't uh, usually associate Kodin in the art of Dimpa with a medieval Zen monk painter such as Sesson, but in fact, Kodin made copies of Sesson's works and modeled the composition of his famous red and white plum blossoms, which you see here, at least in part upon a triptych by Sesson, the one that's illustrated in this slide below. And uh, Frank Feltons has written more in the catalog about the Edo period reception of Sesson. So I asked you to refer to that essay when possible. In the modern era, Sesson was known to be a favorite of Okakura Kakuzo, an influential commentator on the history of Japanese art, who gives the painter special attention in his writings. And Sesson was swiftly recanonized from the early 20th century onward in the pages of the art journal Kokka, with many of his works achieving designation as important cultural properties. Alongside this canonization, the monk painter uh, also became a regional hero in the post-war era. Because Sesson was closely associated with the Tohoku region, among the many local museums that proliferated in the Northeast during the post-war era, Sesson was featured in a fair number of exhibitions and research projects. He's been something of a research specialty among art historians at Tohoku University in Sendai. And in fact, much of what we know about him today is due to the efforts of scholars based in the region. Now, many aspects of Sesson's life are simply unknown. Although time does not permit a deep dive into the circumstances of his career, I'll make three brief points here concerning Sesson's biography that are of particular interest. The first is that as a Zen monk painter, Sesson is notable for having never visited Kyoto, of course, Japan's ancient capital and the cultural center of the medieval period. Sesson was born in the castle town of Hitare in Hitachi province in Northeastern Japan uh, which is on the map right where I'm circling the cursor uh, near the modern day cities of Omiya and Ota in Ibaraki prefecture. Sesson trained at the Zen monastery Shojuji around there and probably stayed in the area for over half his life until past the age of 50. Then he left 
due to the incessant warfare of the period, known as the Warring States period. And for several decades after that, he moved around uh, he, and uh, spent around 10 years in the Kanto area uh, from the years around the years 1546 to 1556 in the castle town of Odawara in Kamakura before spending his final years in the far Northeast in the town of Miharu in present day Fukushima prefecture at the top of this map. But as far as we know, he never went to Kyoto. Why is this significant? Well, it suggests that Sesson may have acquired a mastery of the vocabulary of ink painting far from this major cultural center. And that in fact, his distance from the capital uh, can be understood as a factor in the development of his highly idiosyncratic and appealing approach to figure painting, to picture making in general, excuse me. The second aspect of his biography that merits emphasis here is that we know less about Sesson now than we did even 20 years ago. That is because certain long-standing assumptions about Sesson have come to be questioned in recent decades. His dates, for example, have been revised and still remain unstable. They used to be situated from around 1504 to 1589, but have now been moved back by one zodiacal cycle to approximately 1492 to 1577. More importantly, however, a major painting treatise that was widely attributed to Sesson has now been definitively proven to be a forgery of the late Edo period. The text in question, usually translated into English as advice for students, Setsumon Peishiung, was influential well into the modern era in shaping the image of the artist as a wandering, insouciant, carefree figure drawing his inspiration from nature. And it was because of this text that Sesson was once believed to be a disciple of Seshu, which is certainly not the case. So we appear to know less and less about Sesson's life circumstances. We have an abundance of paintings and few facts to go alongside them. In this regard, however, a number of works are intriguing for the tantalizing clues they offer regarding his persona. Uh, Sesson's self-portrait seen on the left here, for example, suggests someone with poetic erudition as reflected in the self-inscribed poem at the top, uh, kind of uh, scrawling, sprawling uh, in two columns in the upper right, um, which allude to the early Chinese scholar poet Wang Tzuyo. Sesson was also uh, a calligrapher and there are a number of so-called bokseki or uh, ink traces by Zen monks uh, attributed to his hand that survive. And there's even a tea kettle with his inscription cast into it, suggesting perhaps that he was a practitioner of the Chanoyu tea, tea ceremony as well. But otherwise, his profile remains largely opaque. We know less about him than we did 20 years ago. He is as elusive as ever. And the final point I'll make about his biography is that in attempting to understand how his life related to his pictorial production, a network approach may be more promising than a regional approach. While there have been a number of attempts to situate him stylistically or art historically within the regional ink painting traditions of Eastern Japan, commonly grouped under the rubric of Kanto Suibokuga or Kanto ink painting, these have not been highly illuminating. Much has been surmised about the teacher with whom Sesson studied and the lineage with the, which he may have been affiliated, but all of this still remains within the realm of speculation. Situating Sesson within a regional microhistory has yielded few dividends, but mapping out the networks within which he appears to have moved and interacted opens up more promising vectors of inquiry. Barbara Ford, in a truly pioneering study of his self-portrait, has already called attention to Sesson's affiliation with uh, a highly distinctive Zen Dharma lineage known as the Genjuang or illusory abode lineage, which can be traced back to the Japanese disciples of the Chinese master Zhengfeng Mingbun, who was active in the early 14th century. It may be possible to understand Sesson's movements and doings in part by studying further the influence of the Genju on lineage in medieval Japan. And this is a lineage that spanned all of Japan, not just the Northeast. In what follows a bit later on, I'll be highlighting his connections, Sesson's connections with the network of temples and individuals affiliated with an under-recognized cultural institution known as the Ashkaga Academy. And this brings us finally to the work which will be the focus for the remainder of the presentation, the Dragon and Tiger Screens in Cleveland. 
Dragon and Tiger has long been one of the artist's most renowned paintings. It was illustrated in the earliest history of Japanese art authored by the Japanese government, the abbreviated history of art of the Empire of Japan or Nippon Teikoku Bijutsu Ryakushi, which uh, was published in Japanese in book form in 1908. The works also have a provenance that can be traced to two well-known collections in the modern era, those of the Mitsui and Satomi families. When the screens entered the Cleveland collection in 1959, Sherman Lee, then the director, declared them in the press release as, uh, quote, the only important Sesson screens in the Western world, end quote. This may have been unfair to the landscape screens that had entered the Chicago Art Institute a year earlier, but nevertheless, it reflects the enthusiasm that greeted the arrival of a work that was already considered in Japan to be a monument of Muromachi ink painting. Now, the pairing of dragon and tiger is usually associated with Taoist symbology and the cosmological forces of wind and rain, as suggested in a famous diptych attributed to the Chinese monk painter Mu Qi in Kyoto's Daitokuji Monastery. It's the work that you see here. The inscriptions on the Muchi diptych, which are in the inner corners of this diptych, uh, which I've spelled out here, uh, read, the unfathomable dragon brings about clouds, and the roar of the tiger generates fierce winds. As these inscriptions suggest, uh, this uh, is a work which explicitly links these animal subjects to uh, these forces of wind and rain. And as works such as this diptych were brought to Japan, the pairing of dragon and tiger became a popular subject for hanging scrolls and were eventually adapted to screen paintings during the Muromachi period. Sesson's screens dramatize the link between each uh, creature with these natural force forces. The dragon in the right screen appears to emerge out of a violently roiling sea, whereas the tiger in the left screen sits steadfast amidst a powerful wind that bends the bamboo in its wake. The ink work is virtuosic, especially in the smudges that highlight the dragon body in the waves below. As opposed to the ferocity of earlier Chinese depictions of this theme, Sesson's screens render their protagonists in a benign, one might say even comical manner. The tiger looks sideways at his companion with a quizzical cat-like demeanor, whereas the dragon, eyes bulging out of a human-like face, whiskers flailing tentacle-like, spreads its arms out in what some Jap Japanese commentators have called a kabuki pose. Surely each of you have people in your lives to whom this dragon bears a resemblance. In fact, these qualities of the Cleveland screen have played a role in broader attempts to characterize Japanese painting vis-a-vis -vis Chinese painting. When Sherman Lee purchased the Sesson works, he likely had on his mind a pair of Chinese dragon and tiger paintings he had purchased in Japan the year before in 1958, which he attributed to Mu Qi. In comparing the Sesson screens to this pair, Li would characterize the screens by Sesson as reflecting a more general tendency among Japanese painters to humanize their subjects. The art historian Tsuji Nobuo would extrapolate from the Cleveland screens the playful or humorous character of Japanese art vis-a-vis -vis its continental counterpart. While I would be hesitant to posit such broad national characteristics from these two works, the comparison is interesting, among other things, for its reflection of the way in which Sherman Lee appears to be shaping, through his purchases for Cleveland, a larger narrative about East Asian art history. And it is clear that the Cleveland Sesson screens had achieved such a high level of recognition that they served as a vehicle through which larger propositions were made about the nature of Japanese painting overall. So where does that leave us today? Where do we go now? In my own study of the work, it has been helpful to reaffirm and resituate the space-time coordinates of the screens within Sesson's career. This is not easy to do because again, we do not know much about him. But thankfully, the study of the artist's seals has provided a rough master chronology in establishing a basic sequence for his works. Seals, of course, have always been a focus of connoisseurial judgment, but in recent years, thanks to digital databases and the outstanding work of colleagues in Japan, seal analysis has been taken to new heights of exactitude and sophistication. This analysis consists primarily of mapping combinations of seals and of tracking the progressive wear and tear on individual seal impressions. 
In the case of Sesson, it is believed that the artist used some 20 different seals, of which you see six of the most common ones here. And thanks to the efforts of the art historians Akazawa Eiji and Ogawa Tomoji, we have a reasonably accurate chronology of his entire corpus. The two seals pressed on both sides of the Cleveland screens are also found on Sesson's portrait of Iten Sose, which you see on the left here. It's a work that uh, dates to the year 1550. And uh, the match of the seals strongly suggests that Dragon and Tiger was painted during a span of 10 years from approximately 1546 to 1556, during which Sesson was known to reside in the Kanto region most likely spending time in the castle town of Odawara and in Kamakura. At the time, the sitter of the portrait uh, you see here, Iten Sose, was the abbot of the monastery Shoun, uh, Sounji, close to Odawara. It was the mortuary temple of the Hojo warlords, uh, the lords of the castle town of Odawara. And the same pair of seals that are on both dragon and tiger and this portrait are found on a number of other works believed to date from this decade created in the Kanto region by Sesson. Firmly situating dragon and tiger uh, in, to Sesson's stay in the Kanto region during the years 1546 to 1556 or so is significant because despite the fact that Sesson was probably over 50 years of age when he arrived, this was a period of tremendous growth and transformation in his painting. Kamakura had been a flourishing cultural and religious center during its heyday in the 13th and 14th centuries as the shogunal capital under the Minamoto shoguns and the Hojo regents. It witnessed the establishment of two early and influential Zen monasteries by emigre Chinese monks, uh, Kenchoji and Engakuji, which became repositories of Chinese painting and other karamono or Chinese luxury goods. Odawara, meanwhile, was at the time a thriving castle town under the control of Hojo Ujiyasu, head of one of the most powerful warrior families in Eastern Japan until its eradication by the hegemon Toyotomi Hideyoshi in 1590. In the Edo period, the castle uh, at Odawara was rebuilt and then again in 1960. So you can still see it today as in the picture in the lower left, although the Sengoku version of the castle did not have a tall tenshu or keep, uh, the one that you see here. Under the Hojo warrior house, Odawara became a thriving cultural center that historians refer to as a little Kyoto, particularly notable for the practice of tea, poetry, and painting. It was also a thriving trade entrepot that connected Odawara to other port ports across Japan and East Asia. The Cleveland screens appear to showcase an interregional matrix of pictorial sources that had sedimented in both Odawara and Kamakura by this time, and that must have served as new references for Sesson, who used a composite approach in combining them into a large scale work. In Japan, numerous dragon and tiger pictures were modeled after Muchi's Daitokuji triptych, which uh, we've already witnessed and which may inform the general scheme here. The presentation of the dragon in Sesson screens, however, in its complex submergence and uh, reappearance amidst vaporous clouds resonates closely with the tradition of Chenrong, a celebrated Chinese dragon painter. Rather than a work by Chenrong himself, uh, he was a painter active in the 13th century, it's likely that Sesson drew upon a number of later Ming dynasty works in the Chenrong tradition that were circulating in Japan at the time. I've illustrated here several examples of the type of work I'm referring to. And you can see, uh, for example, in the Tokiwayama Bunko Ming dragon painting, the bulging eyes that are uh, similar, or the kind of general uh, winding in and out of the clouds of another work in a private collection. But I could show many more examples of uh, Ming, anonymous Ming dynasty dragon paintings in the tradition of Chen Rong that uh, resonate quite a bit with the Sesson dragon. There are examples in the British Museum, in St. Louis, in the Beijing National Palace Museum, and so forth. Meanwhile, the somewhat cartoonish tiger in Sesson's screen is most likely modeled more upon the gentle looking felines of Joseon period Korean paintings, the likes of which were known to have been circulating in Japan during the late medieval period. And here I've illustrated uh, two early 16th century Korean tiger paintings of the kind that I'm referring to, both of which have a provenance uh, in Japanese collections extending far back 
into the pre-modern period. And as you can see here, they're very different from the scowling tiger of the Muchi uh, prototype we saw earlier. Perhaps the most intriguing model evident in dragon and tiger, however, is the foreground wave of the right screen. Its form suggests that it is modeled upon a famous painting by the Chinese monk painter Yu Jian, who was active in the 13th century uh, and whose work titled Wave and Shore uh, must have served as the, the, the reference here. It no longer survives. This earlier work by Yu Jian was a prized hand scroll in the Ashkaga Shogunal treasury and was recorded in an inventory of the Shogunal collection compiled during the 1460s. The painter Hasegawa Tohaku relates that the hand scroll was cut in half and mounted as a pair of hanging scrolls by the eighth shogun Ashikaga Yoshimasa. And among tea masters of the late 16th century, Yu Jian's pair would be more highly esteemed than any other work. Indeed, during the Momoyama period, Yu Jian's wave and shore must have been the most famous Chinese work in all of Japan. Eventually, it entered into the possession of the hegemon Oda Nobunaga, and one of the two scrolls was destroyed in the Honnoji rebellion that led to Nobunaga's demise in 1582. The subsequent fate of the other painting is unknown. Now it's unlikely that Sesso never directly encountered this very famous uh, painting, Wave and Shore by Yu Jian, uh, even though the Hojo had a number of works formal in the Ashikaga collection. But instead, somehow he was able to make a second or third hand copy of the work. And this is a work that still survives in a private collection. As you can see here, the noodle-like waveform is the same as what one finds in Dragon and Tiger. And this becomes a characteristic motif again in Sesson's later works. The multinodal matrix uh, of references of the Cleveland screens reflect the importance of both Odawara and Kamakura as cultural centers and important repositories of East Asian pictorial classicism distinct from Kyoto. Sesson's stay in these locales allowed him to develop more complex, large-scale works, and indeed most of his surviving screen paintings date to after this period. Dragon and Tiger can thus be situated at a turning point in the monk painter's approach to picture making, one that reflects his status as both a provincial and worldly artist at the same time. But Sesson's stay in the Kanto is important for our understanding of the meaning of the painting subject as well. I've already mentioned earlier the traditional association of this theme with the forces of wind and rain and its vague categorization as a Taoist theme. This is certainly the case, but takes on a different context when we look more closely at Sesson's movements and the circumstances of the period. More specifically, the work I would propose bears a close association with an institution known as the Ashikaga Academy, Ashikaga Gakko, and in particular with the practice of military divination in late medieval Japan. The Ashikaga Academy, located in the province of Shimotsuke or present day uh, Ibaraki prefecture, was a school for Zen monks that focused on the study of the Chinese classics and which flourished in particular during the late medieval period. Despite its name, it was not connected to the Ashikaga shoguns who ruled from Kyoto. The name derives instead from its location in the city of Ashikaga. Its origins are murky, and it is believed by some to have been established as far back as the early Heian period around the ninth century. What is certain is that by the 15th century, it was under the control of the Uesugi clan of warriors in Northeastern Japan, and was, uh, a very, uh, was really flourishing uh, during the 16th century. Remarkably, the academy has survived with its library uh, mostly intact into the modern era, and its buildings were refurbished around 15 years ago. So you can visit the campus today and witness buildings such as the ones you see before you. The Yashikaga Academy uh, had long been regarded as a school of Confucian studies, intended to impart familiarity with classical philosophy and commentarial texts to Japanese Zen monks. But thanks primarily to the studies of the literary historian Kawase Kazuma, who closely examined the collection and curriculum of the Academy. We now know that the academy in the 16th century was focused not so much on Confucian classics as it was on training Zen monks to become military diviners for daimyo lords of the Sengoku or warring states period. In particular, the academy curriculum focused upon the Yi Jing or Book of Changes, an ancient Chinese divination text and the large number of commentaries on the Yi Jing from later centuries. 
Based upon mastery of this text, monks who trained there would go on to serve warrior houses all over the main island. Military divination was in high demand at this time and was de rigueur for large and small warrior clans to help in choosing auspicious days for battle, whether or not to form alliances, and all manner of issues, large and small, concerning combat and strategic decision-making amidst an ever-shifting political and military landscape. It was for divination in these matters that Tokugawa Ieyasu summoned the ninth head of the academy, Kanshitsu Genkitsu, to serve in his inner circle during his final years, and also why the academy enjoyed the patronage of the Tokugawa shoguns throughout the Edo period. Sesson appears to have had ties with the Ashikaga Academy. His travels took him in and around the locale of the academy. And I'm showing you this map here. Uh, you can see the Ashikaga Academy is marked number eight. And Sesson is known to have spent time in the castle towns neighboring the academy of Sano, Yuki, and Koga. Several of Sesson's paintings illustrate erudite subjects, classical Chinese anecdotes that appear closely related to academy culture. And I'm showing you one example here in the Yamato Bunkakan titled Confucius Teaching Moderation with Suspended Pots, which illustrates a famous anecdote by, uh, of, in which Confucius teaches the kind of wisdom of the middle way by explaining how a pot half full will not tip over, whereas a pot filled with water or empty will in fact uh, tip over. Sesson's training at Shojuji Temple uh, near his uh, birth town of Hetare had a close institutional relationship with the academy and was known to have borrowed manuscripts on occasion. And the monk Keijo Shuzui, uh, who appears to have been a mentor or possibly even a Dharma master to Sesson and who inscribed two of his paintings also had close affiliations with the academy. And I should just explain that there are some who believe that it was uh, Keijo Shuzui, a monk who was uh, at one point an abbot of Engakuji Monastery in, in Kamakura, who gave Sesson uh, the character Shu to his name, Shuke. And um, what you're seeing here are two paintings that are inscribed by Keijo Shuzui. The one on the right is dated to 1555 and must have been done in Kamakura during uh, Sesson's stay in the Kanto region. Now, we'll return to Dragon and Tiger in a moment, but first I'd like to consider further Sesson's relationship to the Ashikaga Academy. And in doing so, the year 1546 looms large. That is the year that the warlord, Hojo Ujiyasu, defeated the Uesugi clan in the Battle of Kawagoe and established hegemony over the Kanto Plain. This also means that the Hojo took over primary stewardship of the Ashikaga Academy from the Uesugi. And it was around this time that the then head of the academy, a monk by the name of Kyuka Zuyo, began to serve the Hojo as a military diviner, apparently traveling back and forth between the academy and Odawara. And incidentally, I'd like to mention that uh, Kyuka, this military diviner for the Hojo, was a major figure in the history of divination. And among other things, he formalized the transmission of secret teachings of divination at the academy much in the manner of Zen uh, Dharma transmission. And you're looking at a scroll, uh, which actually dates to the early 17th century. It's a copy of a work by Kyuka, which bears the secret teachings now in the Keio uh, University Library. The fifth month of 1546 was also one of the few dates for which we can account for Sesson's movements. He's recorded as having given the warlord Ashina Moriuji a scroll of secret teachings concerning painting and having departed the castle town of Aizu Wakamatsu in the north. Um, and I believe that's when he traveled uh, through the region of the academy to Odawara, where new patronage and possibilities awaited him. The Sesson was in Odawara precisely at the time that Hojo Ujiyasu and the warrior, uh, Hojo warrior clan extended its hegemony over all of the Kanto plain, became patrons of the Ashikaga Academy and began to rely on the academy head Kyu Kazuyo as its principal diviner. Given all of these circumstances, I believe that uh, the patron for Dragon and Tiger was most likely Hojo Ujiyasu himself. Now, aside from being the Lord of Odawara and the most powerful warrior in Eastern Japan at the time, Ujiyasu was a major cultural patron, having invited the Denga poet Socho to Odawara the year before and mobilizing 
uh, artisans from all across the region for the rebuilding of the Tsuruoka, Tsurugaoka Hachiman Shrine in Kamakura over an eight year span from 1532 to 1540. Sesson almost certainly had an audience with Ujiyasu uh, and I believe likely carried out commissions on his behalf, possibly even in the capacity of a painter in attendance. But of greater significance than the patron is what the circumstances under which Dragon and Tiger was created tell us about the meaning the work may have held for its initial audiences. The work is clearly related in some way to the practice of military divination in late medieval Japan, not necessarily in a literal sense, although the powerful uh, directional vector of the wind in the tiger screen and the circular vortex of the dragon screen might vaguely appear hexagramic. Rather, dragon and tiger can be understood as projecting not only in its symbolism, but in the totality of its pictorial qualities, a world conceptualized through the prism of the Yi Jing. This is a world constantly in flux in which the basic stuff of the universe is understood as inherently dynamic and unpredictable. This dynamism is implicit in the very nature of its being, which is constantly generating and regenerating without cessation. The myriad phenomena around us are in constant fluctuation, polarities are alternating, situations are waxing and waning. Everything is continuously changing. And according to this conception, divination is related to how one understands the nature of the world as ever changing, of how one gauges the modalities of change in the present moment and how one attempts to chart a course of action amidst all of the oscillation and per per permeation. It is the art of fathoming the unfathomable. If dragon and tiger had a tense, it would be the future imperfect. In this regard, one might say that dragon and tiger visualizes the spatial and temporal dim dimensions of this world of prognostication. The dragon is the spatial component. It manifests states of visibility and invisibility. It snakes in and out of the atmosphere, coiling through the ether, showing its head on occasion while other parts are invisible, suddenly appearing and then disappearing. It oscillates between perception and imperception. That is the point. Its pictorial essence lies not in the depiction of a mythical creature so much as in the rendering of states of exposure and hiddenness. The tiger is the temporal component. It visualizes the principle of waiting, of biding time, of reading the situation and finding the perfect moment to spring, of understanding how to choose between action and inaction. In some sense, it is an expression of the flow of time itself. It goes without saying that these principles are easily transposable to military strategy. As the famous saying goes, crouching tiger, hidden dragon. And these principles take on new valences in the context of warring states Japan, particularly circa 1550, a moment when battle in Eastern Japan was reaching a peak of intensity. These semantics would have been immediately apparent to figures such as Hojo Ujiyasu and the cultural sphere of Odawara, or really any castle town in Japan at the time. In Dragon and Tiger, I'd like to emphasize here the crucial role performed by ink painting and the materiality of sumi ink itself in the expression of these principles. The liquidity of ink here is manipulated to maximum effect in the conjuring of an inherently dynamic world. Gradations of dark and light imbue the landscape and ocean with endless rhythm. The gray tones of the atmosphere suggest powerful forces at work in the background, especially in the tiger screen where the forceful wind blowing from upper left to lower right, bending the bamboo and seemingly the earth itself, uh, but in doing so, serving to highlight the steadfastness of the tiger. But most of all, the infinite plasticity and variability of ink is showcased in the areas around the dragon itself, which upon close observation reveal areas of staining and pooling and even spraying or splashing to feature the imminent emergence or perhaps submergence of the creature into the void to highlight the oneness of the dragon with the elements themselves. Many questions remain concerning Sesson, his life, and the nature of his painting. But as I uh, have attempted to pro propose here, 
even the minimal context that can be excavated for dragon and tiger places the achievement of this work in higher relief. The screens successfully assimilate a composite of authoritative East Asian pictorial models through a dynamism of composition and mastery of ink work to uniquely give form to a transmogrifying world, inexpressible in words, one that spoke visually, if you will, to the concerns of feudal daimyo and the circumstances of warring states Japan, for viewers whom we imagine were preoccupied at every moment with the foretelling of what was to come. And in doing so, Dragon and Tiger offers us an intriguing perspective, different from the one generally embraced until now, of what Zen monk painters did, of the mental world in which their paintings were animated with meaning, and of the richness and many remaining mysteries of the culture of medieval Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kyo Lippet. Your lecture has really helped us experience the Freer Sesson exhibition, which was sadly canceled last year and intended also to commemorate the victims of the 211 earthquake. But it also provides us with tremendous insights into Sesson, his idiosyncratic style, and an understanding of Zen monk painters and their role in medieval art. We'd like to ask some of our distinguished audience and friends to also add their comments and responses to this wonderfully illuminating talk. And we thank you, Kyo. I'm going to turn this to Helen. Thank uh, you so much, Amy. Um, I can, we have some questions in the Q&A box uh, for you, Professor Lippitt. Um, the first is uh, from an anonymous person. He asks, is it possible Sesson was a sensei among a school of painters rather than an individual or the work being that of an individual exclusively? Could that explain the lack of clarity about him alone? Yes, um, it's, it's uh, certainly the case that Sesson oversaw a, a studio and we imagine by the end of his life, a fairly large studio uh, that was producing paint, uh, paintings. We know that there are at least four major warlord patrons that he served uh, during his lifetime. And in fact, um, a, a number of his uh, late paintings are actually more probably those uh, characterized as works by disciples than by uh, Sesson proper. And um, there is even uh, several recorded cases of uh, disciples being given the seals of Sesson after his death. Um, Edo period uh, biographies record uh, more than a dozen disciples of, of uh, Sesson. So he was certainly someone who oversaw a large uh, studio. And I should mention that there are uh, at least two other dragon and tiger screens uh, a uh, by Sesson that are known. One of them is in the Nezu Art Museum. Uh, in Tokyo and is probably a later, later work which um, is fairly mannered. It, uh, it has been called by some commentators to, to, to be uh, you know, a studio work or by disciples. And there's also another work that shows up in an auction catalog in the pre-war period, which uh, you know, I would love someday to surface again uh, to compare with the works in Cleveland and Nezu. That sounds like it would be wonderful. Um, there is uh, another question. Were there any hidden political meetings, uh, meanings in Sesson's paintings that you know of? Um, that's, a, that's a challenging uh, question to uh, answer uh, kind of simplistic, simply. But um, what, there are a couple of ways to approach the question of the political dimension of Sesson's paintings. One is that we know of at least one instance in which a uh, warrior house gifted a Sesson painting of, of, of a falcon to another warrior house. And in fact, it was common to use such uh, paintings as gifts in the gift culture of medieval to early modern Japan. Um, and uh, many of 
Sesson's paintings, by virtue of the fact that they were probably made for warlord patrons, have a political dimension to them. But what I find interesting about a subject matter is the prevalence of, of um, subjects related to Taoist immortals, which is uh, there's a much higher quotient of Taoist immortal, immortals in Sesson's corpus than in that of any other painter of the medieval period. And this probably has something to do with his relationship with the uh, network uh, surrounding the Ashkaga Academy, which I discussed earlier. Thank you. Um, so moving on, there's a lot of sort of technical questions uh, about the screens in particular. Uh, there is a question, any thoughts on how the expressions of dragon and especially tiger either play into or play against the Biobu's possible role in military divination? I'm sorry, could you ask that question again? I sure, yeah, yeah, hold on. Um, I dismissed it too soon uh, and now it's hidden. Um, any thoughts on how the expressions of dragon and especially tiger either play into or play against the Biobu, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, B-Y-O-B-U, possible role in military divination? Well, uh, they certainly shouldn't be taken literally. Um, one of the things that um, uh, is interesting about the history of divination is that it was essentially uh, among the elite, elite status groups monopolized by the Omyodo Bureau, the Bureau of kind of yin, yin yang uh, affairs in the imperial government uh, for, many, for centuries. And even the earlier Kamakura warrior uh, government relied on Omyodo practices, which included a lot of esoteric Buddhism. And What's interesting about the Ashkaga Academy and its approach to military divination is it represents a shift from uh, practices based in the imperial Omyodo tradition to those of the Ashkaga Academy, which were much more focused on uh, Sung period commentaries on the Yi Jing and much more calibrated to the practical realities of warfare among Sengoku Daimyo in the 15th and 16th centuries. And uh, these, um, the dragon and tiger screen um, simply uh, is, is not a, uh, in some literal sense, the illustration of a, of, a, of a specific divination, but rather is based, is uh, participates in a kind of a cultural uh, vocabulary of divination that would have been common to um, many of the actors involved in Sesson's world, uh, the military warlords, certainly the Zen monks and so forth. And what's interesting is that the format of the screen, which comes up in the question, um, allows for the dramatization of these principles because uh, there's a big difference between depicting a tiger in a hanging scroll format and in an expansive uh, folding screen format where you really see its, uh, its experience is steadfastness against the, the dramatic depiction of wind angling against it uh, in visceral fashion. Thank you. Um, following up on the question of military divination, um, someone else has asked, how do other dragon tiger paintings fit into this context of, of military divination, if at all? Is this unique or is this part of a larger uh, history? It's an interesting question. Um, there aren't many uh, dragon and tiger paintings uh, before Sesson that survive. Um, I, th I believe that a number of them were created uh, on the basis of Mucci's diptych and other works um, as a form of, uh, of, of karamono, a kind of a Chinese luxury object. And it was specifically in that case, its relationship to the modal painting of Mucci that gave it uh, cultural value. There is an interesting screen in the Daitokuji collection by a monk named Jonang Etetsu, which predates Sesson and which is clearly based on the uh, Muchi diptych, which I understand in terms of its uh, relationship to a prestigious Chinese source. But over the course of the 16th century, and especially after Sesson, there's reason to believe that this type of divination is, it becomes a primary context for dragon and tiger painting in Japan. And I would just point to one other example which is a famous uh, Kaiho Yusho 
uh, painting of a dragon that's now in the Kitano Tenmangu Shrine in Kyoto. Now, uh, this is of a tremendously interesting work because Kaiho Yusha also has some relationship in his background uh, to military divination. Uh, I believe it's, um, it's possible to imagine that uh, his, uh, he, he uh, I can't remember if it's his father uh, had a, a relationship to divination and Kaiho Yusho himself is from a military background. Um, so I believe that this is uh, a, an important context for a certain swath of painting up through uh, the early Edo period and certainly works sponsored by the Tokugawa Shogunate also have some relationship to uh, military divination. Wonderful, thank you so much. There's one last divina military divination question. It's a very hot topic. Um, and then we're gonna move on. Um, did military divinators ever fall from grace due to bad advice or were the admonitions sufficiently elliptical and Delphic that military failure could be turned back upon the warrior as failing to understand the advice? I know that's not quite art historical, but I'm curious too, um, if you know. This is indeed a, a fascinating question. And you know, there are many aspects of this uh, history that haven't been uh, properly fleshed out, partly because the prevalence of military divination in, especially in, in late uh, medieval Japan during the Sengoku period has not been as well studied as, as it could be. Um, this is partly because it was seen as an irrational practice. And there is a tradition of, um, I think there's a there's been a bias in the study of, of Japanese history and in, in East Asian history. Uh, Joseph Needham is very famous for this in the Chinese context of really focusing on uh, the of, of, of the sciences and kind of um, concrete knowledge traditions and kind of um, redacting or eliminating uh, precisely these kinds of seemingly superstitious practices from the proper study of history. So, so divination isn't a, isn't a practice that's been studied as well as it could. But what's fascinating uh, for me uh, from, from what I've gathered from uh, the role of divination in, in 16th century Japan is the degree to which Zen monks are central to this. And again, we think of Zen monks as, you know, practicing religion and kind of otherworldly, uh, focusing on kind, uh, kind of otherworldly concerns, but, but they were heavily involved in, in divination and in fact traveled with uh, warriors to battlefields conducting daily uh, uh, divinations. The case of Kanshitsu Genkitsu is the ninth head of the Ashikaga Academy who served uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu is the most famous and uh, working backwards from Ieyasu to the figures who were active in the 16th century is more problematic because there are very few sources that remain. One imagines that if a divination went wrong, there would be nobody that survives to tell about it. So uh, that's my kind of um, cheeky answer for the moment, but I think it's a, it's a wonderful question worth exploring. Thank you. So moving on to a question uh, more of provenance. So what happened to the, this dragon and tiger screens after the fall of Hojo in 1590? How did the Tokugawa, how did it come to be in the Tokugawa collection? Well, the dragon and tiger screens were never in the Tokugawa collection. We actually don't know the whereabouts of the screens until uh, 1908 when they're published by the Japanese government. And at that point, they're in the Mitsui uh, collection. So, um, we, it's, it's fascinating to think about, uh, you know, what uh, their provenance looks like. Uh, if I'm correct, and it's a work that was made for the Hojo family in the 16th century, um, we have to imagine that the collection was dispersed uh, uh, at some point and that very little uh, that was in Odawara survives after the attack of uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi's forces, which basically eradicated the entire uh, Hojo family line. Um, the, there, that said, um, again, I, I do believe there was a close connection between Sesong and the warlord Ujiyasu. And incidentally, there is a record from the Edo period that Ujiyasu's son, Ujimasa, was a, dis, a Zen disciple of Sesong, that he actually studied Zen uh, religiously with Sesong. And uh, whether uh, or not that's true is hard to say. It's probably apocryphal, but I think it points to the idea that the Ses that Sesson had a close relationship to the Hojo warrior family and that lived on in cultural memory and that uh, possibly Hojo Ujimasa who becomes a formidable 
warlord himself, a little bit after Sesson's time in the Kanto region, uh, was also uh, an important patron of Sesson's. Who knows? Thank you. Um, I think we're sort of coming to the end of our discussion. It's now almost six o'clock. I want to hand it over. Yes, to Amy. Well, I think we should uh, allow the one more question. There is one that takes us out of the realm of Zen and Confucian ideals. I think if you can just raise the last one, Helen. Sure. Is the last one on the Q and A? No, the pear dragon and painters oh. from different contexts. Hold on, let me just find that. Um, so uh, an attendee asks, uh, paired dragon and tiger screens were produced by many painters from many different contexts, including a famous pair by Kano Sanraku in Mio Shinji, which has been shown to have been designed for a display along with other screens in the central room of the Hojo, a setting that parallels the use of Muki attributed hanging scrolls in Zen liturgical contexts. If Sesson's CMA screens were pursued, produced for Hojo Ujiyasu, in what context do you imagine their display or use? That's a that's a challenging question. Um, you know, my my view generally of folding screens uh, from this period in particular is that uh, they weren't necessarily um, the focus of acts of viewing and contemplation so much as serving as backdrops that surrounded and animated so spaces within which uh, um, social, social and ritual activity uh, took places. So I would slightly alter the question, which is a very good one, and ask what were the kinds of activities that such a work um, uh, w was intended to accompany? And um, that's, a, I'm afraid, is something that, again, uh, for which I don't have uh, uh, any great answers. Uh, I will say that um, it's long been believed that the screens are unusually large in scale uh, for folding screens of the 16th century, and that this possibly points to some kind of special outdoor uh, context in a military encampment uh, uh, for display. But actually, the screens are not, uh, not necessarily outsized compared to uh, contemporary folding screens of the period. And um, I don't think the scale allows us to say yay or nay concerning uh, its, its the specific spaces and context in which it was used. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to hand it over to Amy now to thank you for your wonderful lecture and, and for this great Q&A. You know, we often have a few questioners at the end of any talk. And tonight, as you can see, everyone, there were many, many exciting responses to Keo's presentation. It was so stimulating, Keo, a really wonderful, marvelous program for us and giving us a lot to consider and think about. We, I just want to not only thank you and everyone for joining us, but we hope that all of you will join us again in February for our next two JASA webinars. First on Sunday the 7th when we will be looking into Japanese folk art from the perspectives of two very dear friends, the JASA board member David Kahn and author Ty Heineken. An invitation will be distributed this week and information will be added to our website. We also have a special program later in the month on the 17th, which we, when we'll be joined by the Netsuke Society of America for a special presentation. To all of you, good evening and thank you again, Professor Lippitt.